Good morning. Welcome to Forest Hills United Methodist Church. My name is Teresa Edwards, and it is a joy for me to welcome each and every one of you as we gather here in worship in person and, of course, online. So wherever we are, we are here to praise God. Will you pray with me? Gracious and holy God, on this beautiful day, we thank you for the chance to offer our hearts to you once more in worship. Wherever we are, we are worshiping you, God. With every breath, we desire to worship you. With our words, our actions, our attitudes, our resources, we want to worship you. And in this hour especially, O God, we want to give you the praise that only you deserve. Receive the gift of our worship and make us whole in this experience, we pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stay seated, but to join me in our welcome chorus, His Name is Wonderful. You will find the words on the screen. Once again, we welcome you and are so glad that you're worshiping with us. And we ask that we would just tune our hearts to the Spirit of God. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And the Spirit of the Lord is here. So as we enter into this week where we'll be celebrating the 4th of July, we claim that freedom in Christ. And we also claim that we are God's people and we sing to God. Our opening hymn is When We All Get to Heaven. Isn't that a good one? That's a good one, isn't it? And we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Please remain seated as we sing.
whether we are wearing a mask or shouting our praise to the sky, we proclaim our faith with the Apostles' Creed. Will you join me? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In this very moment, we can pray together, and God hears and receives our prayers. What an incredible blessing this is. So let us pray. Gracious God, who comes to us in the form of a son, Jesus Christ, it is you that we praise today. It is you that we lift high as we magnify your name and give you glory. We pray that what we offer today would be pleasing in your sight. For you are God and we are your people. It is in love that we offer ourselves. Holy One, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to come among us, to be our champion. We thank you for the life that Christ lived and still lives as our guide. We pray that you would make us more Christ-like and forgive us our sins, that which would become an obstacle for others to see Christ in us. Make us strong as your church to be a beacon, a light, a hope, a safe place in a world that often feels risky and dangerous. And give us courage to take you wherever we go, that we too might share the good word that you are here, you are love, you are our savior indeed. And it is you, O oh God, who taught us to pray, and we join our prayers together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I got a little nervous there when I saw Brant leave the piano bench during the prayer, and I thought, oh no, maybe we don't have special music this morning, and he pulled out all the stops. We had really special music. I love that song. Uh, we are going to continue to walk through the book of Hebrews. We're going to finish chapter 2 this morning. We're going to pick up um, the story at verse 9 and read through the end of the chapter, and this morning I'm actually reading from the Christian Standard Bible. But we do see Jesus made lower than the angels for a short time, so that by God's grace he might taste death for everyone, crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the source of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. Again, I will trust in him. And again, here I am with the children God gave me. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. For it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels, but to help Abraham's offspring. Therefore, he had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. For since he himself has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus, the Bible says, became like us in all ways. He experienced the human condition. He, he faced up to temptation. But I'll tell you, there's a difference between Jesus' humanity or his experience of humanity and ours. And before you think I'm preaching heresy, I'm not, okay? Jesus was a human in all ways like we are. But when Jesus faced temptation, he didn't give in. So the image of God in Christ as a human being was not marred by sin like it is in each one of us. Jesus is the pinnacle, the zenith of what it means to be human. If you want to know what it means to live a human life as God desires, look no further than Jesus because he did it perfectly. Whereas we do it in fits and starts, and we all are willing to admit that we do it imperfectly. Christ got it right. So why did Jesus become human? The author of Hebrews, the preacher, gives us at least eight different reasons in these few verses that we read. And I'll tick them off for you real quickly. In verse 9, he says, he came human so that he could experience death, to bring us to glory, to sanctify us and bring us into his family, to destroy the devil who had the power of death, to release us from slavery, to become our high priest, to make propitiation or atonement for our sins, and to help us in our temptations. In all these things, Jesus became human so that we could become like him. He lived his life perfectly so that he could impart that perfection to us. There are two sentences in this passage that, in my mind anyway, as I read it this week, kind of boiled up to the surface. And I want to focus on those. The first one is in verse 10. In verse 10, we read this. For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, should make the source of their salvation perfect through sufferings. There is a really cool word in this passage. It's translated in this passage as source. The Greek, literally, it's two words put into one. First and ruler. He is the first ruler. Other English translations use the word pioneer. One of the commentaries I read this week used the word captain. He is the captain. The problem with captain is a captain can actually stand back behind the fray and send the soldiers into the battle while all he or she does is map out what they should do and bark orders to everyone. That is the exact opposite of what this word means. The word first leader is the guy who charges into the fray and accomplishes perfectly what needs to be done regardless of who's following. 
A good English translation would be trailblazer. He is the trailblazer. A great word for it is champion. In fact, in ancient Greek literature, this very word, source, pioneer, author, trailblazer, champion, was used of none other than Hercules. In all of the feats that Hercules did, this word is applied to Hercules. you got to love that. The same word the preacher is applying to Jesus. He is the one who took upon himself our human condition, lived as one of us, was a trailblazer and champion for us, and he lived as a human being perfectly, without blemish. In Matthew chapter 4 and in Luke chapter 4, we read about the temptation narratives of Jesus, and he was able to square up against temptation without giving in. Without sinning. In that regard, his experience of temptation was much more difficult than ours. Because what's the easiest part of temptation? Oh, you know it. Don't you play coy with me. The easiest part of temptation is giving in. Because once you give in to the temptation, what happens to the pressure? At least for a little time, it's gone. So if you're feeling the pressure to tell a lie, and you tell a lie, Oh, I got out of that embarrassing situation. The pressure's off for a season. Jesus never had the pressure off by giving in to temptation. He saw it all the way through to the other side where he experienced victory. And only after experiencing victory over the temptation was the pressure lifted. We could have come up with a whole bunch of different ways to look at the idea of squaring up against temptation. But I thought we could use chocolate. How many of you are tempted by chocolate? We're looking at chocolate as sort of a parable or a metaphor for temptation and sin. How many of you are actually tempted by chocolate? You have a chocolate. You should have gotten one on the way in. And how many of you have already eaten it? You were told that you had to resist the temptation and not eat the chocolate. Okay, well, this is kind of a a standard level of chocolate. It's actually one of my son's favorite kind of chocolates, but not for me. It's kind of, the bar is kind of low on this chocolate. Unless you have a graham cracker and a marshmallow, I can pass on that particular kind of chocolate, okay? It's not much of a temptation for me. This kind is a little bit more of a temptation for me. Oh, anyone tempted to run up on stage right now and rip this open and eat it? Well, to be honest with you, this in this format, it's not much of a temptation for me. The way I like to eat these is to put them in the bottom of a teacup, get a spoon, mash them into absolute mush, put a scoop of really good vanilla bean ice cream on top, mix it all up until it melts. Now you've really got something that tempts me. But in and of itself, I'm not too tempted by that one. I got more. <laughs> all right. Here's one that doesn't tempt me all that much. I've tasted it. It's, it's all right. Ghirardelli and it's dark chocolate sea salt caramel. This is the one that Carolyn would really be tempted by. The, the salt and the sweet with the caramel. This would be Carolyn. And some of you are holding up your hand or pointing to someone else. This is a temptation to you. Come and get it. All right, that's it. it's not much of a temptation for me. It's good. I'll eat it if there's nothing better around, but I can usually find better than that. And this is what's better than that. Oh, technically, this isn't even chocolate, it's white chocolate. It's by Lint. This is delicious. If you have not tried it, it's delicious. I, I really love the white chocolate by Lint with shavings of coconut. And I didn't think you could get them anywhere but Amazon. After the sermon, um, Derek McAleer told me that it's his favorite chocolate. And he went to the store to CVS. I guess I tempted him really good. He went to Walgreens, rather, and took a picture of the lint chocolate with coconut. And I guess he bought a bar for himself to enjoy this afternoon. That is a really strong temptation. But now we're really getting into it. I went to Kroger I'm sorry, to Publix in Macon, Georgia, uh, over the past week, and I found this. If you can't see it, it is a coffee crisp. It has a sticker on the back of it, imported from Canada. Oh, I I don't even like coffee. 
oh, but these ones, let me tell you, this is the apple in the Garden of Eden. This. This is pulling at me right now. In Canada, we spend about 90 cents Canadian on these things, which in Canadian money, what's that in American, like five cents or something? It's, it's nothing. You buy a boatload of them. It's about 70 cents American. Here, it broke my heart to spend a dollar seventy American on this one little bar. But I figured it's for a sermon illustration. It's worth a dollar seventy. And trust me, this week when I break this bad boy open, it's going to be really good. But I can resist this for now. I've got one more bar. Just one more bar. Gear Deli. Intense dark, dark chocolate, hazelnut heaven. Hazelnut heaven? Well, it can't be that bad if it's got heaven in the title. It can't be too bad a sin if it's hazelnut heaven. Well, let me read the ingredients, okay? Sugar. You can't go wrong. It's not artificial. It's natural. Unsweetened chocolate. It's unsweetened. It's health food. <laughs> Hazelnuts, cocoa butter, milk fat. These are all good things. Milk. On the sixth day, God created animals. One of those animals was a cow. Milk comes from cows. On the sixth day after creating the cow, God said it was very good. The other five days of creation got the check mark. It was good. The sixth day, God said, it's very good. It's very good. It's... It's, it's heavenly hazelnut. I, I'm, okay, I'm not going to eat it. I'm only going to look. Doesn't our culture tell us it's not a sin to look? What a broken culture. Well, I'm going to look. That looks good. That. Look at the back of that. You can see the goodness of, of God's creation. Don't you lust after my chocolate bar. But you can see the goodness of God's creation bursting out of the back of this bar with those hazelnuts that God in his perfection made. I'm not going to eat it though. I'm going to resist the temptation. I'm just going to smell it. The, the fruit in the Garden of Eden, they were allowed to look. They were allowed to smell, I'm sure. But they weren't allowed to, to eat it. So I'm just going to smell it. I'm not going to eat. Oh, I didn't eat it. I just, I just tasted it, but I really didn't eat it. You can eat your chocolate if you want. Folks, isn't that the way we sometimes play loose and coy with temptation? We, we rationalize the temptation. We, we think through, well, it can't be that bad. If, if I have a, a deep longing for it and God made me, then it, it's not that bad. And, and I'll only take a little bit. I'm not going to go whole hog into it. I'm not going to be gluttonous. It's just a nibble. And, and before we know it, we've plucked the fruit. We've sunk our teeth into the fruit. And the juices of the fruit that God told us not to eat are now running down our cheeks. And it's delicious. Because sin does something to us. The, the reason we sin is because it satisfies some deep urge within us. It feels good in the moment. But then what happens after we give in to sin? Before too long, that crashing guilt comes on us and we realize we've strayed from the path that God has laid out for us. And instead of bringing satisfaction, what it ends up doing is increasing the hollowness within. And we're not talking about chocolate. We're talking about real things that God says don't do, and we do. Or real things that God says do this, and we refuse to do it. And in giving into the temptation, we end up feeling miserable afterwards. Well, the Bible is very clear that Jesus faced up against these temptations, again, not for chocolate, but for the, the deep-seated things that we long for as human beings that are forbidden by God. And Jesus faced up against them and had victory through them. So if we want to have victory through these things, we look to Jesus, who is our trailblazer and our champion. The other passage that I wanted to look at is verse 14. 
Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these. He shared in our flesh and blood so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is, the devil. When you look at this world, does it look like the devil is destroyed? Doesn't look like it to me. J just an hour up north in Atlanta, Georgia, is one of the hubs of sex trafficking in the world. And that's in our backyard. It doesn't look like the devil is destroyed. The Greek word for destroy uh, literally means to be made impotent, to be made powerless, to nullify. So the power of the devil has been destroyed except for that power which we give him over us. There was a preacher that I read about this week that before he became a preacher, while he was in his 20s, he was a postman. And, and I really resonated with this story because since moving to Prince Edward Island, my brother became a postman. He goes and delivers the mail. Well, this, this would-be preacher ends up going to the house for the first time, this particular house. He opens the metal gate and steps inside, and before he knows it, this loud, barking, snarling, muscle-bound, foaming-at-the-mouth type dog comes charging across the yard at him, and he says, well, I'm a goner. And the dog gets so close and then is yanked back by his momentum. And he realized there was a heavy chain around the collar of the dog. And the chain was set into a spike that was fixed into concrete in the middle of the yard. That dog had great freedom of movement in the yard. But as long as the postman opened the gate and stuck to the path that was clearly defined for him, he was safe from the ravages of the dog. And he realized, th as he became a preacher, this is a parable for our human condition and for living victoriously over the sin. He said, when I went to that house every day from then on, I didn't look at the dog. I didn't listen to the dog snarling, and I didn't see the dog's teeth. All I looked for was the chain and the spike and the concrete. Because if that dog was still contained... It could make as much noise and make as many threats as it wanted. Its power had been nullified. It was impotent against him as long as he stayed on the path that was delineated for him. Well, folks, that's what Jesus does. Jesus curtailed the power of the devil. And we're only bitten, we're only mauled when we go where we shouldn't go. When we leave off the path of Christ and try to walk our own way through the maze, we end up in his territory and then we get ravaged by him. But if we stick to the path that Christ has laid out for us, the path of our pioneer, the path of our trailblazer, the path of our champion, then the power that that beast has has no bearing on us at all. He can't even reach us. He can't even touch us. Yes, he can yap and make noise, but it's powerless against us. I absolutely love the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. I love them. Um, we have all of them on DVD. We watch them fairly regularly, actually. The first one with Captain Jack Sparrow, he is going to the uh, Isla de Muerte. My Spanish is not so good, okay? Isle, Isle de Muerte, the island of death. And the island of death can only be found by those who know where it is. Typical language of Jack Sparrow. It's all convoluted. But anyway, if the idea behind it is if you've already been to the island, then somehow the, the curse of not being able to get there is broken and you can find your way back to that island. Well, that's just like squaring up against temptation and having victory. You can only have victory over sin if you know how to do it and if you've already done it. Well, Jesus knows how to do it. He's already done it. He's proven that he has power. And if we want to have victory over temptation, all we have to do is walk the path that Christ delineated for us. What we have to do is rely on the power that Christ gives to us. The power that vanquished the devil himself. And as we walk the path of Christ, and as we rely on the power of Christ, then we actually have the ability to square up against temptation without giving in. The Bible says that we are a holy priesthood. We are called by Christ to live different lives than we lived before Christ came into our hearts and lives. And, and we're not just called to this thing called holiness. 
the author of Hebrews gets into it frequently. We are actually commanded to live holy lives. The Bible says without holiness, no one will see God. And that's not just the holiness that God imparts to us through Christ. It's the holiness he expects out of it because the power of Christ that, Christ, that, that he puts in us. So if we want to live the life that God is calling us to live, if we want to reflect the image and likeness of God in our everyday lives, Jesus has already shown us how. He's given us his power. He's laid down the path for perfection. And he commands us to walk on it. The good news is when we fail, forgiveness is there. Restoration is there. Christ restores us to his grace. No questions asked. Our sin is taken as far as the east is from the west, and he remembers them no more. But here's the other side of the good news. Through Christ, we don't have to stay on this treadmill of sin. Sin, sorry for sin, ask for forgiveness, be forgiven, be restored. Back to sin, sorry for sin, ask for forgiveness, be restored, sin again. That treadmill that we're stuck on, we can get off of. Because our Savior is not only powerful enough to forgive us, but as our trailblazer, as our champion, he is powerful enough to give us his strength so that we can square up against temptation and, like he did, experience victory on the other side. Folks, that's the life that I want. That's the life that we are called to as disciples of Christ. And I pray that God would open our eyes to see that that's the life that we can all have that we can square up against those sins that so easily entangle us and we can have victory through them because of who Christ is and because of the power that he imparts to us. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the salvation that we have through Christ Jesus our Lord. And we thank you for the forgiveness that he imparts when we wander off the path that he has called us to live in and go to those places where we are ravaged and tripped up and life becomes less than it should be. But God, we thank you that that does not have to be our lot in life. That because Christ pioneered a new way, because he was our champion, we can walk the path that he walked. We can have the power that he had. He wants to give it to each one of us so we can live the life that he lived. Lord, open our eyes to those areas where we need your strength. Where we need to more perfectly walk the path that Christ told us to walk so that we can reflect glory back to you in the lives that we live. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we seek to live this life with Christ, we join together in hymn number 724, on Jordan's stormy banks I stand. We'll sing stanzas 1, 2, and 4. And of course, the words are on the screen.
is the week that the upper room should be available. So Teresa went and found them. They are on the table in the narthex if you would like to get one on the way out. As you leave, remember that you do not leave God's presence in this place. But you have a champion. You have a trailblazer in Christ who goes before you into this world. Who has already squared up against temptation and has lived victoriously bringing glory and honor to God. And through him walking in his path, walking in his strength you too can be victorious over your temptations. Amen.